Hi, and welcome to the 32nd episode of the Machine Ethics Podcast. This month, I'm joined by Kate Devlin from King's College and the author of the book, Turned On, Science, Sex and Robots. Kate Devlin joins me in person to chat about the cottage industry of sex robots, how chatbots appear in sex tech, gender AI chatbots and culture, the complexity of human intimacy and technology, taboos in sex tech, and how sex tech could be a positive enabling thing, and much, much more. If you'd like to support us, then please go to patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. Find all our past episodes at machine-ethics.net or contact us at hello at machine-ethics.net. And thanks very much for listening. Hi, Kate. Hello. Hi. (laughs) Thanks for joining the podcast. Thank you Um, for having me. If you'd like to briefly introduce yourself, uh, who you are and what do you do? I'm Dr. Kate Devlin. I'm Senior Lecturer in Social and Cultural Artificial Intelligence in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. Nice. And you previously you were at Goldsmiths, right? Previously, for 12 years, I was um, a Senior Lecturer in the Computing Department at Goldsmiths, yeah. Yes, yeah. And you've got a quite... Uh, interesting background because you did archaeology and then you went to computer science. Jump ship and then I went back and then I went again and then I, so I've been, it's been zigging and zagging between sort of humanities and archaeology and computer yeah. science for quite a while now. Yeah. And now you're back in the humanities department. Back in humanities, which is nice. Um, it's it feels like a nice fit at the moment with the work I've been doing recently. Mm-hmm. But I still have, I'm, I'm the sort of techie person in right. the humanities department. We're not all techie people there. There's a real mix and it's really lovely. That's one of the things that makes it so good. Nice. Um, so I had this uh, quote from your your website, which um, talks about you being the face of sex robots, which <laughs> okay, is quite a horrible the publisher said that. <laughs> um, sort of uh, idea, isn't it? Well, they're, they're, they're being amusing about that because um, my publisher chose to put it that way. Essentially, mm-hmm. in the Daily Mail a few years ago, there was a story and they had a picture of a sex robot and they captioned it with my credentials. So they had the sex robot with Dr. Kate Devlin from Goldsmiths underneath it. <laughs> so I am literally the face of sex robots, according to that. Right, um, but that's obviously not the case. That is not the case, no. no. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm by no means the first person to study this at all. It's been quite a few people looking at this over the years. So right. about 2001, Peter Zaro, who's a, a philosopher, was giving it some thought and made a little documentary about it. And then in 2007, David Levy wrote Love and Sex with Robots, which is kind of the book that kicked it all off. Right. And, and you've got your book, which is the... My book, Turned On, Science, Sex and Robots. Yes. yes. And that came out last year, right? That came out in October last year, yeah. yeah. It's been a bit of a roller coaster since then, but yeah. I was talking before we started about your TED Talk, mm-hmm. and what I took away from the TED Talk, which was on the subject leading into your work now on, on the book and, and such, and this continued interest, but it's, it seemed to me very optimistic... Yes, I'm a techno-optimist, I would say. I have some fears about the way technology is going. I don't Mm. think it's entirely beneficial, but I think that we are much more suspicious of it than we should be because the benefits tend to be really, really good, even though we tend to fear technology when it first emerges. Mm. So I do see great scope for people with technology, and already we had the internet that's connected people all all over the world. And those connections haven't just been in terms of bringing together family members who are apart, but also people finding their tribes, which I think is a really big thing. So, you know, you, you might feel isolated and alone, but if you're online, you can usually find someone who's very similar to you. And I think that's a very mm. powerful thing. Yeah, and that, and that kind of feeds into how we should think about technology generally, but also the intimacy part of what you're studying. Yeah, so I'm very interested in about how we can use technology to connect people. So to make those initial connections, yes, but also mm. how we can keep that going over time so it might be a long distance relationship it might be family in different places it might be someone you never met before you want to connect to or it might be someone in in your life regularly but you want to have some better way of connecting to them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or some more intimate way of connecting. or, or more it, intimate. It also also more intimate so yes. i'm interested in all the connections intimate yes. and otherwise intimacy is a really interesting one because I mean, I, first of all, I started looking particularly at the, the sexual side of things because I thought that was really interesting. It's quite taboo, but very fundamental to being human. Mm. Um, but the more I did on that, the more I was interested in other forms as well. So not just pure sexual side of things, but also just in terms of, of how we can be close to people as well. Yeah. So I've, ne- I've neglected to uh, ask the first question, which I always ask, um, <laughs> which is, uh, Kate, what is AI? What is AI? Okay. 
That's, that's a really tricky question because when I was writing my book, I have a chapter of basically accounting, you know, what is AI? And I had to go and do a lot of work and to find mm. out what really it is because mostly we take it as being a shorthand term or an inclusive term for machine learning. And of course, it's more than that. It's about machines that can respond in a, an intelligent manner, which we're currently taking to mean a human-like manner. I don't think it should be limited to that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be machine learning. That's one form of it that is currently very popular. But it is the idea that a machine can exhibit some kind of intelligent by our standards response. Yeah, so it's a relative intelligence. I think it is a relative yeah. intelligence. And I don't think it's, it's limited. Um, there may be forms of intelligence that we don't recognise. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There are certainly... There's a massive debate around whether or not machines can ever be conscious, can ever be sentient. And I'm quite agnostic about that. Mm -hmm. The community's very split on it. Um, I think it may be possible, but it may be forms of consciousness that we have no idea even exist. We might not recognise them. Yeah, um, which is a big problem. I think we, on the previous podcast, we talked a bit about that and how it might be sort of impossible to know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and we might, you know, in a similar way that I can never know if you are right. Necessarily so you could find a big not. philosophical rabbit hole. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it gets really, really head wracking. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. absolutely, there's no test for consciousness. And we thought we had a, a test for machine intelligence. We thought we had the Turing test, but the Turing test is simply a test of deception. Really, it's mm. kind of machine fool you into thinking it can think like a human. And the consciousness idea is so much more complex than that. And we we can't even test if another human is conscious. So how are we yeah. going to check a machine? Uh, <laughs> uh, great. No, no, like answers there then. No, none. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, I I have to uh, say that I, I know little about this area in, um, of intimacy and robotics. Yeah, good cover and... story. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in my house. Right? <laughs> um, uh, so I I believe I, I know little about it. So I was wondering if there is like some like a lay of the land of the types of Types of devices, types of objects, types of um, interfaces in this, well, realm. Yeah, D disappointingly, if you're looking for a sex robot, you're probably out of luck. So really what there is in the world mm. today are a few prototypes, not really at the widespread commercial stage. There is absolutely no corporate backing mm. behind this. It's a handful of workshops worldwide that are taking some sex dolls, they're putting in some interactivity, they're putting in a little bit of animatronics, they're putting in some kind of chatbot personality, and that is the extent. There's been no market research, they're relying on the market of people who buy sex dolls, it's very, very niche, and I think it will probably stay niche in this format. But there's a much wider market for sex technology, which is technology that doesn't take the form of these human-like robots. And so we have things like smart sex toys, um, we have virtual experiences, we have, beyond the sexual, we have things like care and companion robots. So there are people forming connections with machines. Yeah. So your studies are bridging into the medical you know, elderly care robots, that sort of thing as part of the intimacy and... Um... Kind of, yeah. I'm interested in that. I mean, it's not an area that I have a huge background in. Mm. I'm interested in the social side of it rather than the kind of care side of it. So I'm interested in what is it that people get out of this interaction mm. and how do we interact with something that is a different category from our usual interactions. So we're very good at adapting our social interactions depending on the category that we're in so you know a formal one or an informal one friends strangers this is a new form where we're going to have to make up new rules about how to navigate that and I think that's incredibly interesting yeah and do you have any kind of insights on how that might play out or no especially I think we can of... we can look um certainly at what's happened in the past few years and one mm. of the one of the things I find most interesting is voice assistants they have been adopted really quickly and very uncritically into the home. Mm. Um, I'm really sceptical. I won't have one in my house. I'm really, really dubious about privacy and security around these things. I don't think they're nailed down shut enough. Mm. But people have very quickly adopted to having that technology. And it is very beneficial. But I mean, it's just a glorified search engine that's powered by voice. Uh, but when we integrate things like chatbots where you can get a conversation going and it does feel more real, I think that element of companionship comes across. So you get mm. people anecdotally reporting that they chat to Alexa when they're at home, it makes them feel as if they've got a companion around. And we already do this to an extent with non-responsive technologies. So if we're at home alone and we want some company, we might put it on the radio, we might put it on the mm. TV. So it's taking that another step further. And I find that 
really, really interesting about how quick people are to adapt to that and to use it as a form of social connection. Yeah, because I feel like I'm the devil's advocate here. But do you think that we can obviously take that too far? And there is this idea that maybe we become less connected socially. I am quite sceptical that that will happen. Mm -hmm. I think we are very, very good at differentiating between the human and the machine. And we have lots of stories about oh, people who are on their smartphone far too much. I mean, I'm one of those mm. people, clearly. <laughs> I'm sort of bonded to my phone. But we, we are good at regulating. There are always going to be outliers. There are always going to be people who find that harder. But by and large, our lives are now dictated by that technology. So I may be on my phone a lot, but it's mm. also how I interact with the world. It's how I get my email. It's how I stay in touch with friends and family. It's how I pay my utility bills and do my banking. So really, we, we have that in our lives already. It's to think that we're being too reliant is an over-exaggeration. Right. The idea that we're, we're already there is almost you know, a scary thought in itself. Well, we are, but at the same time, we're, we're surviving. In fact, mm. we're thriving with it. So we find friends. I mean, I would say most of my really close friendship circle are people that I've met over the years online in different forums. And I think we do that really easily and we do that really well and we are opening ourselves up to a much wider social circle Mm -hmm. there are still social rules that dictate that there are still barriers in place in terms of inclusion in terms of diversity but we are able to find people that share our values all over the world and that to me is a really powerful thing now when you take it a step further and say what if it's not another person what if it's a machine that you're sharing your values with okay that's a different matter i think that There are times when you don't even know if you're talking to a bot online. This already happens. Um, We give when we so sometimes when we want interactions, we just want to have that voice coming back to us, almost like an echo of ourselves. So if we're just looking for someone to validate us in some way, there are bots that already do that. There are therapy bots. There are all sorts of things, and we can Mm. feel that validation. For a true connection, right now we still need the humans at the other end. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very good. We yeah. are very good at being human, and we're very good at finding other humans. Some people, mm. some people aren't able to find that as easily, and it may be that we can provide some technology that helps them do that. Even if it's so, it's constructing something that which is actually beneficial for them through um, how they operate socially. Yeah. How, how they their world works. Yeah. So it. we're kind of mediating social engagement and social interaction via the technology. So I don't think we're putting humans out of the loop just yet in that case. Yeah. I mean, this is the the Machine Ethics podcast. We like to talk about AI. But obviously that goes into lots of different areas, uh, robotics, um, tech industry stuff generally, and obviously uh, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, the humanities Mm -hmm. and um, other areas. Could you, are you currently seeing a lot of um, maybe chatbots you are seeing, but more kind of uh, smart or intelligent um, algorithms being used in an area which might be um, intimate or sexually? There are some. So the, the company that's developed the world's first commercially available sex robot, as they like to refer to it, Abyss Creations. So they make sex dolls, love dolls, known as real doll. And they've also branched out into animatronics and they've made a a sex doll that has an animatronic head and has an AI personality. And that AI is chatbot, essentially, is geared up to be flirtatious. They've actually got quite good AI going on. They've got a really nice user interface for it. Their UX is pretty good. They've got, you know, this wonderful sort of sliders where you can yeah. rearrange what aspects of the personality you want. And that's for the user. That's for the user, yeah. Right. So you can pick and choose your personality of your virtual girlfriend essentially. There's mm. a virtual boyfriend one in the works, but they haven't quite got that released yet. So right now, even though their robot version, the, the physical hardware version, isn't really out there mass mm. production and probably it will never be mass production. Mm. The virtual one is you can have you can have for twenty dollars or whatever you can have this virtual girlfriend um, AI chatbot. Yeah, so we're seeing the rise of that, and then we have things in Japan like Gatebox, which is this holographic girlfriend, um, you know, sort of pint-sized holographic girlfriend mm. in a jar, essentially. That's not yet connected to an AI chatbot, but is they're hoping to do that, they're hoping to integrate that in the future. Yeah, and that sounds like a, it's almost a vision taken from Blade Runner, that It's one. pretty much that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. And that's one of the things, this whole thing is really fed strongly by narratives around artificial intelligence and science fiction. 
Yeah, and do, I mean, there's not a lot of positive depictions always in that world. Yeah, I mean, where's, where's the where's the sci-fi good story if everything goes smoothly, right? Yeah. So the whole the whole thing hinges on this dystopia, <laughs> and we do we see uh, we see a very long history of dystopia when it comes to artificial lovers, artificial partners, artificial friends. You know, especially if it's a female robot, if it's a gynoid, a realistic-looking woman-like robot, then the sort of standard story trope is that they will be beautiful but also dangerous you know they're the yeah. femme fatale they will go rogue and destroy you yeah, yeah. very long standing story it won't be they had a nice time and and they all lived happily they ever all after, lived happily ever after. <laughs> alas no <laughs> you, you know we had a, a bit of a bumpy start but we we were fine in the end alas no no, no. it's all it's all like if you think of the end of ex machina if you yeah. think of you know, Blade Runner with the, the the perfect girlfriend who was ultimately sacrificed. You, you get all of these stories. You get either the, the the perfect biddable companion who sacrifices herself mm. and, and loses out, or you get the one that goes rogue and sort of uprises against the patriarchy and tries to destroy everything. You know, it's a bit women know your place. <laughs> <laughs> know your place, but also rise above it. Yeah. In the, in the fiction. <laughs> yeah. Funny, a good dichotomy. Um, and I guess, again, we don't have any depictions of male... Or, or, or actually, in the AI... The Steven Spielberg yes. film AI, we have yeah. Gigolo Joe, which is a really interesting one because Gigolo Joe, although he is a pleasure mech, mm-hmm. we always see him in a romantic context. So the idea there is that you know he can tilt his head and play good music, you know, sexy, romantic music. But it's always very much done on the emotional side of things. So whereas all the female... The guy knows the sex spots all tend to be incredibly sexual in nature. He's much more romantic in nature. So mm-hmm. there's definitely a double standard going on. <laughs> but it is um, um, the actor... Jude Law. It is Jude Law. It so... is Jude Law. It is Jude Law. He never, yeah, I mean, it's Jude Law in a tight-fitting bodysuit. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and yet escapes the same kind of sexualization in that you know, if you think of... Um, Characters like Ava and Ex Machina, or yes. even in the disembodied sense, um, Samantha in the film Her, which even though it's disembodied, this is an AI that has no form, still manages to come across as incredibly sexy because everyone knows it's Scarlett Johansson's voice, right? Yeah. So there's, there's really this characteristic is imbued that is a flirtatious and sexy woman behind it. Yeah, and it's just a, it's the sexualization of something which interestingly has no gender interestingly has no gender and yet all the voice assistants that were created today all started with a female voice and there are moves to make sort of gender neutral versions of those it's it's really tricky and i've seen loads of different scientific so-called scientific evidence being wheeled out for that none of which stand up to much scrutiny i have to say right um you know the things about oh well we prefer women's voices or they're easier to hear none of these have any scientific backing it's interesting. I, I fear it is a case of Silicon Valley just doing what they do best and, yeah. you know, a bunch of guys designing for a bunch of guys. Yay. <laughs> um, so that was not a point of comment. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. Um, I, I, I don't disagree, to be honest, on that one. Um, so I guess on that, I mean, all this stuff feeds into what will be the future of this sex tech and how that goes play out the dystopian uh, science fiction visions um, not all of them dystopian maybe her is an example of something which is not necessarily dystopian yeah her is not particularly dystopian it's a story it's a kind of a story where the woman bolsters the the, the guy so that he's back on his feet and able to go out there and love again you know That's it's, true. it's another yeah. one of these women in the service role I mean, a bit cynical when, I, when you've seen one of these films you've seen them all you know it's, it's always got that kind of outcome um, unfortunately but yeah <laughs> yes yeah but it's not like they kill the protagonist or, they don't in this case yeah. yes um, and spoiler alert spoiler sorry everyone <laughs> um, so I guess this will fe- this feeds into the vision of what that industry might turn into yeah I, I think co- even calling it an industry is it's quite a lot of cottage industry. Yeah, it really is. It it's, it, li- it basically is. It's mm. handcrafted products. Mm. It the people making these are making maybe you know it takes eighteen weeks or so for a best creations to make one of their dolls. It takes men much much longer for them to develop Harmony, which is their sex robot, and that's not yet available um, other than a prototype. So. There really is limit in what is being made. There's a few factories in China 
who are producing again mechanized dolls but it's very very limited in terms of any advanced technology and it's really not feasible we're so bad at making human robots it's really really hard to do it's not cost savvy it's mm. not economically viable um, and it's really hard and you know it's people aren't accepting of it so not only is there taboo around the whole idea of the sex side of things but just even the uncanny valley effect where we see these things and go oh no no thanks you know that that still really prevails yeah yeah um and i think i mean given that this may be turned into something which isn't mass market we won't necessarily be seeing corner shops or you know uh, adult shops with these things in their, their windows quite yet but we will be seeing artificial um, chatbots and things like this um, ai yeah. chatbots which we may and like you were alluding to earlier with the alexas and, and chatbots in our houses that we were going to have some attachment to yeah and i think that is the stronger case to be made i think that when it comes to advancing technology and everyone has a future of robots i don't think that's necessarily the case and i think that the idea of the chatbot, of the virtual, of the software rather than hardware mm. is much, much more realistic about the way we're going. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you might have a, um, a chatbot assistant that is able to wake up to, you know, tell you that you look nice in the morning. Yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's not, that's not something that's difficult to do. Getting mm. the interaction going and getting to say the right things at the right time is slightly harder, but you can definitely already do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what do you think the, the social impact of that sort of connection might be? I'm optimistic that the impact is not detrimental. So I think that we are good at categorising those interactions and being aware that this is a machine and you know, we, we, mm. we, treat, we treat things socially because we are social creatures, we treat our virtual assistants socially, yet we also know that they are limited. And I think we're going to see a continuation of that. Um, we are so far removed from having any artificial general intelligence that I don't think we have to worry about something seeming really real yeah we're mm. going to always be reminded of the glitches the glitches will be thrown up all the time yeah we'll uh, get constant reminders of just how they, they don't work well <laughs> um we'll and then we we'll just turn them off and we'll turn them back on again and it'll be fine yeah possibly <laughs> <laughs> um i mean i think don't get me wrong i think yeah. while this is a really compelling story and i and i honestly think that it can be quite beneficial to have someone to chat to even if it's just a machine and we've seen this with the use of therapy bots like robot for example but we get, you know, we, we have that interaction um, and I don't think it, it means that we're going to neglect other humans in the process. I think it's much like a tool. Um, mm. We can use it like that. Yeah, so it's almost um, not an intimacy tool, but a tool for outsourcing um, maybe your own cognitive ability to make links with other things, other individuals. Absolutely. And we do that all the time. We outsource our cognitive ability all the mm. time. It's just one of the, the ideas of extended cognition and the very idea you know, that with, with my phone, I never need to remember directions anymore because I have them on hand. I never need to recall phone numbers from memory because they're stored in a machine. And of course, you know, that frees our brains up to do many other things like, you know, going on the internet. Yeah. Instagram. <laughs> just like Instagram, Twitter, <laughs> all of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess more explicitly, because you're here and I get to ask you these questions, um, more explicitly, how do you feel about um, intimacy with uh, hardware, let's mm. say? Okay. Well, people have been getting intimate with hardware for thousands of years, thousands mm -hmm. of years. Um, mostly, you know, discrete body parts, yep. certain body parts, genitals. So we've had, we've had sex toys, for example, as genital replicas for thousands of years. There's plenty of evidence for that. And we've seen a move into the smarter toy terrain. So we have much more abstracted, interesting designs, things that are customizable or personalizable. This difference between that and a sex robot, for example, is that there's clearly some attempt in the sex robot mm. to make them seem human-like. And honestly, I think it's in that case, it's the element of companionship that is appealing. And the more I talk to people who own sex dolls, the more I find out that it was, it was not the sort of a very basic sexual need that was being fulfilled. It was much, much more complex than that. So mm -hmm. there are people who 
are really involved with the dolls that they own and they give them personalities and backstories. There are people who want them to represent the ideal woman. There are other people who collect them like a hobby, that's like a collector thing. There are other people who buy them as photographic models. There are some people for whom it is the fetish. Their fetish is that they like the doll, they like the idea of the doll. Mm. So it's really, really complex. It's not initially what I thought, which was this is some kind of another type of sex toy. There's more to it than that. Yeah, so it almost it isn't a sex toy. It almost isn't. It's it's about the, yeah, it's about there's there's an element of companionship there. It yeah. makes it different from a, a sex toy. But I think we can merge the the two areas, the sex toy area and the sex robots area, and look at experiences rather than having an object that represents a human and an object that is completely disembodied or discreet and, and different. I think we can merge it into wearable, immersive, all those kind of experiences that kind yeah. of cross that divide. Yeah, so I, I did actually read briefly in um, the introduction to your book that um, there is this idea that we are creating things in our own image. Yeah. Uh, when you, when we, like you were talking about those um, doll-like sexual robots, um, but that we could, we have the opportunity here to make all sorts of different to all things. All sorts of things, yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, we, which would actually be easier because we're so bad at making the human ones. We could do really cool things, and we saw, you know, so we see some similar parallels in virtual reality. You know, in virtual reality, you can be anything, you can do anything, and if we look at VR porn, it's just serving up first-person point of view, which is very obviously because it costs too much money to go and make content that's not that right. It's really there's a limited amount of time, there's a limited mm. budget. That's what gets served up. And I think with robots, I wonder, are we just not thinking broadly enough? And to me, we're still very much fundamentally in an engineering phase for both robotics and AI, in that we're building things to fit a certain need. And we're not yet at the stage where we can look at the design in more detail. And we saw the same with software engineering. You know, we saw, here is some software that meets your needs. Now we're at, here is a software designed for user experience. And I wonder mm. if it will go that way. I'm kind of hopeful that it will go that way. Yeah, and then we'll have... Um a more wider ranging selection of things that might come out of that. I think so. I mean, I've spent I've spent sort of the past twelve years, past thirteen years, teaching mm. human computer interaction and interaction design, mm. and just looking back over the history of HCI, for mm. example, you know, you see the difference that when you start incorporating the user and you start incorporating different ideas of where this will go, you look at your user groups, you look at personas, you look at the whole process of design and then you come up with something completely different from what you first maybe thought of. And I, I think we're not yet at that stage with robotics and AI because the technology is difficult, because the, the costs are very high. And as these things become easier to make, cheaper to make, and we also have seen you know, in the past so decades seems increasingly seen a maker scene that I think is very influential that you start to see oh I can I can make something that's more tailored to me that's more customizable and artificial intelligence is one of the things that offers us is personalization whether that's personalization for you know the data surrounding our healthcare that gives us mm -hmm. targeted medicine you know all of these things perhaps that's a way we will go with this as well yeah so I could tailor my own artificial companion mm -hmm. and that person becomes part of my everyday life. I yeah, guess. right, feasibly, yeah. yeah, that could happen. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. <laughs> well, I'm very much uh, with you on, on the Alexa voice, um, Google Home, all these different devices, uh, front of things. I'm, I'm, I'm wary about having things listening to me all the mm -hmm. time, but I guess if we have ownership over that, then maybe that changes the dynamic. It would be really nice if we did have ownership over that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sceptical about that. And it's something we have to be really aware of. And, you know, of course, everyone takes the terms and conditions in order to use stuff. Yeah, I do it too. And I'm quite sure I'm giving data away that you know, I didn't want to give away. Um, I wear a health tracker, so very clearly I'm comfortable enough to do that. Um, there have been a couple of sex toy hacks in the past few years. So there was the Wee Vibe hack wasn't a hack sorry mm. there was we vibe who were collecting data from a vibrator but the data they were collecting wasn't an anonymized so they were linking it with someone's email address and of course that leads to all kinds of sensitivity issues around that data because with sexual data sure that's that's very intimate data but it's also data that could get you harmed in many places right so this is data that is it could get you blackmailed or or harmed or fall in the wrong hands and we've seen that happen already with things like the ashley madison dating leak um so people who 
divorced, you know, broke down, even killed themselves over their data being out there. So yeah. this is really, really worrying. Yeah, and uh, Ashley Madison was the website for... Yeah, so it's a, a website that was for people who were married to be able to go on and have affairs. And when their data was breached, when the data was all exposed, then people saw their interactions put online and their secret lives were mm. unravelling. And one of the really interesting things about that story is that when, I think it was BuzzFeed that dug a bit deeper on that and they found mm. out that quite a lot of the people thought they were interacting with women, but they were actually interacting with bots. Ah. So it's already happening. Wow, that's mm. interesting. I wonder what the, uh, the motivation from Ashley Madison's side was to do that. Well, they didn't have enough women, apparently. Right. There weren't enough women signing up to extramarital affairs, so they got some bots to entice the men in deeper. Yeah. yeah. Mm. There's a whole thing there, isn't there? Yeah, there really is. <laughs> wow. Um, so I have a few more questions. Um, I wondered if you could comment briefly on the taboos of some of the things which might crop up in sex tech and, and intelligent sex tech, let's say. In general, there are a lot of taboos around sex and people are very wary to discuss it without having a tag of well-being or health put on it quite a lot of the time. Mm. And I think being an academic and looking at something and saying, oh, I'm interested in this because it's pleasurable for people is sometimes not a justification enough. Uh, so it can be a bit of a hindrance, but there are yeah there are loads of taboos. I, there are massive ethical red flags over things. So of course the, the one that springs to mind is the idea of a childlike sex robot, that really worries everyone. And I can completely understand the, the knee jerk reaction there is that can't happen. And then of course if you start dissecting that a little and looking at it and saying well maybe this is something as an alternative that could prevent further abuse, maybe it could be used therapeutically and, and John Danaher's done a really good paper mm. on this and explored it in a lot of detail. Um, there, there may be a case to be made there and uh, trying to get ethical clearance for a study like that is just going to be incredibly difficult. Um, but it, you know, we, we shouldn't just rule these things out completely just because they feel in some way taboo or immoral. We have a duty, I think, to look at the evidence and try and filter it. And which is right now, there's not enough evidence. That's the problem. We don't have mm. evidence. We have to look at parallels rather than the existing information. And is that part of the idea that it is to be that there isn't evidence because the evidence uh, is incriminating? A bit? That's part of it, definitely. So, so part of it is that people are not going to admit to having paedophilic tendencies mm. because it's going to get them in trouble. So there are people out there who have those tendencies and won't admit them, also won't act on them, but are not, you know, they're basically living their lives in fear that they're going to be caught having those tendencies. Mm. Um, perhaps if they had a sex robot that was childlike, they would then feel that those, ten those, those urges were met and they wouldn't live in fear anymore. Or perhaps, as other people have suggested, that's a gateway and an escalation to further abuse. And of course, we cannot test that out because it's just an unethical study to do. So we yes, don't know. yes. Um... Uh, there is a, a play that I was thinking about when, um, when I was considering this question um, called The Never. I've heard of it. I haven't yes. seen it. I'd really like to see that. Yeah. It's, uh, was that a couple of years ago? Wasn't yes. It? Um, it's very good. I, 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 it's by a very good theatre company called Headlong. And uh, I'd recommend it. But they, they're they basically dealing with this issue um, and they deal with it. Um, can I spoil it for you? Yeah, you can spoil it for me. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry, and, and, the, and the listeners. Um, so in the nether, there are characters um, in a digital world, essentially. Um, so that it's, it's kind of an escalated internet slash virtual um, reality. Um, and they have avatars. And in this nether, they can take on other types of people. And one of those types of people is a small girl and um, another person is an old man. And they have these intimate relationships within the, the nether. And the whole play is, is trying to work out where the line is and, and how we feel about that as an audience. Um, even if at the end, the avatars actually are different mm. to the, uh, the persons enacting that relationship, yeah. uh, which is why the the play is interesting and, and pulls on these threads in interesting ways because it has that kind of twist. Or, um, so I, it was just a nice kind of um, yeah. I think it parallel. raises so many questions along those lines, and there have already been some reactions. So already we have laws in place in in the UK and a lot of Europe that's illegal to make computer generated images of child abuse, and. 
wider field, even though I don't think that law is actually the case in the US. Um, but in the US, they've introduced the Creeper Act, which is against mm. childlike robots. And very prematurely, because there aren't any that we know of in existence yet, we barely have adult ones. If we do have childlike ones, we don't know who's making them because no one's going to admit to that. There are definitely childlike sex dolls out there. That is problematic. Mm -hmm. There were something like 260 seizures of those in the past couple of years in the UK and of people prosecuted for those. Many of them had um, images of child abuse on their computers. Um, it's not illegal to own a childlike sex doll in the UK because there's no law for that because the law can't keep up. But it is illegal to import them under a bizarre Victorian law around obscenity. So because you can't import obscene items, they're able to prosecute under that. Mm. So I think it's it's a difficult position because the the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, that's abhorrent and I don't want that kind of thing happening. And I think you have to be careful in treading that line between, well, what is what is feasible, what is real, um, what is the evidence, what is the likely outcome? And, you know, I wish I had answers to this, and I really don't. But I think it's a disservice just to completely say, well, let's, let's ban everything, because mm -hmm. um, bans don't work. We know pretty well that bans are, you know, don't tend to be all that effective. Um, and the reason I differentiate between the childlike version and the adult version, the childlike version very clearly mirrors a real world situation that we don't want to happen that mm. is involves a non-consenting person and you know a child that's not able to consent and so we don't want to right now we want to be careful we want to regulate we don't want to replicate that situation whereas if we have the adult version of the, the sex doll or the sex robot then that's different because it represents a, a consenting relationship so i don't think we can go in and police heavy-handed on that yeah but it's definitely an area that requires careful thought yeah, and there, and there were also, I mean, not necessarily taboos, but there were also other criminal criminalities <laughs> criminalities to do with uh, intimacy, um, like um, harassment and, and things like that. Yeah, which could be, be played out through some of this technology. So, the, there was a lot of fear that use of sex robots would lead to an increase of violence against women, and I took that pretty seriously as a starting point when I was investigating things for the book and did a lot of research and found zero causal link. Um, so we have parallels in computer games. You know, this computer games will they cause real life violence? Well, we don't have any, or rather, we have many studies, but none of them are conclusive. Yeah. Um, we have. People, I think you know, a year ago, there were 81 million users a day on Pornhub, but we haven't seen a proportionate rise in sexual violence. We've seen social changes in terms of sex, but we have not seen an increase in sexual violence in terms of that. I think people are very good, again, at drawing those boundaries between what is acceptable and what is not. There are other problems with porn, um, but in terms of sex robots, we, we don't even have the sex robots yet, but in terms of the sex dolls, the people I spoke to who own the dolls are incredibly respectful and cherishing of them because to them they represent the things that they want. It's a Pygmalion type thing. It's the dream of a real woman. It's, it's treating them really well and respectfully, not just because they're expensive pieces of equipment. <laughs> um, and so I think that it really maligns the owners of these dolls when they get sort of painted with this notion that they're going to be in any way derogatory to women. Mm. I looked a bit deeper into sort of fantasies and and sex and the sort of all the background around that. And you know, the people are watching porn or fantasizing or reading um, erotica and you know there are fantasies there that people will never admit to in real life. And one of the most popular fantasies that comes out is the idea of rape fantasies, and yet no one's going to act on that in real life because they know they're perfectly aware of the divide between the fantasy and the reality. Again, there may be outliers because we always have outliers, but, but the vast majority of people know how to behave in the correct context. And I don't think that there's an increased risk of sexual violence for that matter. There may be a broader sense of these... Barbie doll like sex robots feeding into the whole thing around body image and portrayal of women in the media and that is problematic definitely but I think in terms of an increase in violence we, we have literally zero evidence to suggest that yeah great what are the positive outcomes um, in this industry within this area of sex tech I think there's potential for sex technology to provide people with pleasure whether that's something they are not able to access 
by other means or whether that's something that they have and we can enhance or mediate through technology, I think that's a really beneficial thing. We know, for example, that there is a section of the community, there are people who are elderly who are still having sex in their 80s and 90s and want to be able to do that and are not in a position to do so. And perhaps we could facilitate intimacy, if not the actual sex itself. And you know, sex is a very broad term, so it often gets assumed to be some kind of you know, penis, vagina, to the point of orgasm. I think it's much, much wider than that, and it encompasses intimacy a lot of the time. So there's definitely something there in that we can use the technology to connect people, to provide pleasure for people who may not be able to access it in other ways, or people who want to augment what they already have. And I think that we're, we're already seeing the rise of such technology um, in economic terms, in terms of sex work. Um, so there's the, the webcam industry using smart sex toys quite a lot. So that's already been an uptake there. And if that's something that can facilitate safer and better interactions, then that's a really good thing as well. Great. Well, the, the last question I, I usually ask on the podcast, I think part of which you've already answered. So what are you really positive and, and um, think is, is good that, that's happening with this area in the future? And on the flip side, what is something that worries you, scares you about oh, gosh. <laughs> um, this area and, and also AI? Okay. In terms of the positive side of things, I'm really heartened by people who find company and find companionship in technology, whether that's chatting to Alexa or getting attached to their robot vacuum cleaner. I just think that's lovely that people can feel the connection. And I don't think it's a sad and scary thing. I think it's a very human thing to do. And I don't think it's the downfall of society. I think it's a new form of interaction. In terms of the scary things, there are a couple of things that really worry me. Uh, Privacy and security is definitely an issue. I think the one piece of AI that terrifies me the most at the moment is deep fakes. And I just worry so much about the level of manipulation that's now possible. Not in terms of you know, that we can't outdo it, because we, you know, we, we, we see this and it's really easily accessible so anyone can, can really get their hands on deep fakes and play around with them. Every time we write a tool for detecting it, it gets surpassed and you know, there's this kind of race on to try and detect it. It's not so much even that, it's the fact that once the genie's out of the bottle, once the stuff has gone online, then it's really hard to kill. So uh, we can look at stuff that's happened just in the past few weeks, um, you know, things that are on Facebook that, that, that are very clearly doctored, and we think, why is that still up there? And you're going to say, no, it doesn't mess with our, you know, it doesn't meet our, our problem standards, you know. I think that is really, really scary, the fact that we can't, we used to be able to say, oh, we've seen the video, we've seen the evidence. No, we don't know unless we're standing in the same room as someone at the same time. And it's a bit like revenge porn. You know, the damage is done once it's out there. You can't really undo it. So that frightens me a lot, actually. And, you know, I, as I said, I'm a tech optimist, but actually one of the, one of the other things is, is the lack of inclusivity in tech. And that it's not just things like the bias and algorithms that we're all very, very worried about at the moment. So everyone's very worried about bias and algorithms. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's worrying, but I'm also worried about the people who don't have access to tech because all that data is being collected from people who are tech users. And yet we've still got large swathes of the population who aren't using the gadgets, who aren't online, who, you know, there's like 90% of UK households are online. What about the people who aren't? What about the people who are never feeding into our data sets? They are completely unrepresented. And I just think that's a travesty. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the UK. You that's know, just the UK. That's yeah. just the UK. That's not you yeah. know, the wider. No, it international... doesn't even you know doesn't even go uh, across the the whole world. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we are really seeing a class divide in technology that frightens me a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, let us end on a more positive note. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think um, broadly speaking, that that has been our conversation. Um, so we are positive about uh, sexy robots, I'm calling them. <laughs> we, are, we are positive. We are positive that there's a bright future where people can feel at one with the machine. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so thank you, Kate. How can people uh, find out about you, follow you, um, send you lovely messages, that sort of thing? Okay, Twitter. I'm never off Twitter. Uh, at Dr. Kate Devlin on Twitter. And um, yeah, buy my book. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> buy my book. It goes into all of this and more. Um, turned on uh, Science, Sex and Robots. 
Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Hi again. Thanks very much for listening to this podcast with Kate Devlin. I think maybe counterintuitively, I found Kate's ideas around sex tech really positive. And I know I mentioned in the podcast, but it's maybe something that going in intuitively, you would think that maybe it was a cesspit of horrible things happening and it should be all bad. But as Kate explains, that that's a certainly nuanced area and very interesting technologically and psychologically, sociologically, all these different things wrapped up and it's um, really great to talk to Kate about that. If you'd like to hear some more of my thoughts, then go to patreon.com forward slash machine ethics, where I'd like to post extra stuff about the episodes a monthly reading list, other videos, and when I can, live streams. I've also got a YouTube channel, which is the Machine Ethics Podcast, and I hope to publish more videos there with your support on Patreon. Thanks again for listening, and hope you enjoy.